All right, go. So what sort of security did we have for applications before sandboxing as we know it? Um, that's still the same security that you use for a lot of your existing applications, like anytime you use a command line on your system. It's all just down to the, the traditional Unix permissions model of uh, you know, your read, write, execute for your group, your user, or for other people. Um, it sounds great in principle um, if you think that everything is a file. Um, but it turns out that actually a lot of things are not files. Um, when you want to start applying this quite simple permissions model to things that are not files, um, like socket permissions, or maybe you want to access devices on your system, um, or maybe you want to share access to those devices rather than have them exclusively open by an application. As soon as you want to do more advanced things than just playing with files on the command line, uh, maybe hosting a web server, these become not really sufficient. Um, and this was actually the case a long while before desktop applications in their modern form came along. Um, and that's why we actually had to come up with better permissions models than this traditional discretionary permissions model. Um, but the key point for these old style Unix permissions is that they were common for all of the binaries that you would run on your system. So if you could remove a directory um, as your user, then any application that you run could do that. So any malicious application that you have installed could do whatever it wanted as long as it was allowed to by these permissions and there was no easy way to prevent that. Um, so that's why we came up with something better. Um, a lot of people may not agree that SE Linux was a better approach, but it's certainly a more a uh, complex approach to permissions, and it's certainly a lot more granular approach to permissions. So with SE Linux, you can actually have permissions on things like sockets, file descriptors, what individual processes can do, um, how they can elevate and drop privileges. It's an extremely complex and rich way to describe permissions. Um, that means that a lot of people struggle with it. I'm I am included in that. Anytime I get an SE Linux permissions problem with my desktop system, it frustrates me and I'm very close to turning it off. Um, and I guess this is actually the problem. Um, SE Linux, because it's so complicated, is very good for describing something that's relatively simple, like say a web server. A web server, its task is relatively well defined. It reads files from a system, it maybe does some processing by using a module, uh, and then it gives that output to the internet. Um, it's relatively easy to describe that in some SE Linux permissions model. Um, that isn't necessarily the case with a desktop application. A desktop application might open a file from your system and then they want to print it, then they want to email. So there are so many things that a desktop application does that SE Linux would find very difficult to describe. Um, so actually, in most cases, SE Linux for a desktop application does very little. Um, it is essentially running unconfined as it would have been with traditional Unix permissions. So very good for server applications and relatively simple ones that don't change. Very limited use for desktop applications. So an improvement in permissions, but not the final step. And then come along containers. Uh, so obviously Docker is a very popular container manager. 
there were container managers before Docker, there have been one since. Um, and containers were really the next level of uh, restricted permissions where um, not only were individual access to files restricted, but also access to things like the network um, and pretty much everything else in the system. It was possible with, with Docker to, to use a lot of the modern technologies in the uh, Linux kernel, like uh, user and PID namespaces and C groups, to restrict the view of the system that any running process would have. Um, and of course, much like SE Linux, this was initially um, developed for running server applications. So running a web server or a database server or something like that with a relatively well-defined task. Uh, and that's really where Docker shines, something like that, where you can have a, essentially a script that tells Docker what to put inside this container, what to run, what ports to open, um, and then you have your web server in you know, your hundred lines of the Docker sort of language. Um, and that's great. It works really well for server applications. It's a really common thing now. Um, but it wasn't created with desktop applications in mind. And so some of the extra functionality you have in desktop applications maybe doesn't quite work so well for the Docker model. Um, but nevertheless, the server application is great and it's definitely a step up in terms of security. Um, and it's also a lot more easy to understand than something like SE Linux. It's, uh, it takes the, the approach you know, to restrict everything initially and then to gradually open a few little holes. Um, and that's the technique that we can also use to apply to desktop sandboxing. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So when I talk about desktop applications, it's the things that you run as local applications on your desktop. Um, things like gedit or a web browser or your terminal or something like that. I mean, your terminal maybe less so. Um, but all these sort of little applications that you have to manage your photos, you know, play your music, those sorts of things. Um, and now a container manager for desktop applications is a little different and we actually have to think a little bit more about what desktop applications do uh, that is different from most server applications. I mean, the obvious thing is that they're generally out there in the graphical user interface, so you need to care about Wayland and Linux and how that all works. Um, you have desktop files, so you have well-defined points where an application extends the system, um, and the system needs to have access to bits of the application, so that it can read the desktop file, read the icons, that sort of thing. Um, and also desktop applications access the system over, thing, over IPC mechanisms like Dbus. Uh, it's very common now that nearly all desktop applications will communicate over Dbus, especially if they integrate with the GNOME shell menu, well, that, that's changing a bit now, but it's extremely common. Nearly every application will be using Dbus in some way. Um, and also, um, the other reason that we need to do something special for desktop applications is because we actually want to add a permissions layer in between. We want to have some kind of interactive permissions model. Um, and that is called, or we, we come up with the name uh, with Portal. Uh, and I'll talk about that more in detail later on. Now in terms of how um, the sandbox is created, um, in, in Flatpak, which is what I'm mainly talking about here, um, it's created with a tool called Bubble Wrap. Um, this is actually a standalone tool that you can use yourself. You can create a sandbox manually just by going to a terminal and typing BRAP and you, know, you can read the man page for the information. Um, you generally wouldn't do that. It's not so useful on its own, but it's very easy to integrate um, uh, as part of some scripts or something like that. Um, it's not just Flatpak that uses it. It's used in other Project Atomic um, tools. Um, and it's, it's generally quite useful if you want to make a little, a little sandbox to do something, uh, something very restricted. Good for testing, good for like little, little containers, little toys. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of options that you can use to um, use PID namespaces, UID namespaces, C group namespaces, IPC namespaces. Um, you can restrict networking. There's, there's an incredible amount of options there. Um, the man page has pretty much everything. Um, it also uses setconf to filter out syscalls that you don't want to let through. Uh, this is especially useful for something like uh, Flatpak where 
we don't necessarily want applications inside your sandbox to access applications outside, so we don't think that uh, GDB running inside a sandbox should be able to you know, P-trace stuff on your, uh, the rest of your system. Um, so we can filter out various syscalls that would make it easy to break out of the sandbox. Um, the other thing that Bubble Wrap does is you actually tell it to run, you know, to start this container with this restricted view of the system, and you run a binary. When that, it needs to monitor that binary, so when that binary exits, it needs to exit as well, and it's part of the transfer back to the system, and it does that to you. Um, so I talked about some of the namespacing techniques that we use, PLE namespacing, UV namespacing. What do those actually look like? Um, well, normally, with the traditional Unix permissions model, any process in your system can see what all of the other processes are doing. You can see the PID, you can see the command line that we started with. You can actually leak quite a lot of information through just the information that's regularly available. Um, and actually, we don't particularly want that. There's no real reason why an application on your system generally should have access to any other application that's running on your system. There are very specific cases where this can be useful, but in the general case, it's not something that's desirable. Um, so, what you actually see here, running inside the sandbox, um, is um, PS, uh, and what you see there is that PID1 is actually bubble wrap in this case. That is just a controlling process. It's created a new PID namespace, and your application, in this case it's Bash, and, and PS running under Bash, um, it can see nothing outside of those three PIDs. You can't see anything else. So that's working exactly as designed. Um, this does mean that some things don't work very well. So any system where the PID of your application was needed to interface with something else, uh, and there were some old uh, window manager uh, protocols for this, like ICCCM, um, a couple of other things in X11. Um, they needed the PID for things like making sure the right icon was associated with the window and everything like that. That won't work with this approach. Luckily, this technique has been superseded several times, but there were a few times, there are a few instances where some window managers won't work very well with this. That is part of the uh, problem and, and of, of having these really old window managers that don't support modern standards and they kind of need to modernize a little bit and use something more recent. And it's only a minor thing anyway, but it's not seamless. In terms of the file system namespacing, um, this is actually quite complicated. Um, there are some very simple things that it does, um, which I'll describe here, but if you look at um, the, the list of file systems that get mounted when you go inside a flat pack sandbox, it's quite long. It's maybe a hundred items individually. Um, but then the reason behind this is, is pretty common, so I'll just go over some of the common uh, background. Um, generally, you have a read-only view of the system, so anything that's uh, fine mounted into the sandbox, you only have read access to. Security reasons. Um, the app itself is actually mounted on slash uh, under slash app, um, and that also if your application bundles its own libraries, they're under slash app slash lib as you'd expect. Um, and you have all of the other directories on there slash app slash user, all these sorts of things. So that looks like the traditional slash user on the regular system. We reserve slash user um, for um, binaries and data from the platform. So that's where, when you create a Flatpak app, you say, okay, I want to base my app on, it, say, the free desktop platform or the runtime, uh, or the, uh, the, the main runtime, or the KDE runtime. Uh, and all of those things, all of those base libraries and, and icons and various other resources, those all go into slash user, and are again, read only. Um, if you have any extensions, like if you want to, uh, I mean, locales or extensions, and various other things extensions, like maybe G stream plugins or extensions, that sort of thing. Those are all mounted in their predefined locations, which you know from the extension if you've developed against it. Um, there are also a few other bind mounts, slash run slash host is where pretty much everything from the host, like font caches and icons, all those sort of read only things from the host system that are safe to expose to the sandbox, those are all placed under slash run slash host. Those also include things like FS tab and you know, your SSL certificate store and all these sorts of things. This is why there are so many uh, individual mounts into um, uh, the sandbox. So actually, there's a lot of things from the host system that you want to keep working. You need your SSL certificate store so that all your HTTPS still works inside the sandbox. Um, 
you can also access debugs because the system and session bus uh, sockets are exposed. However, those are in Flatpak uh, filtered with the use of a dbus proxy. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. It's not quite as simple as just being able to access everything. Um, obviously, if your application uses Wayland or X, then those are exposed. A lot of the way that these things are controlled is by, uh, you'll find these in the metadata of your Flatpak app when you build it. Um, you can also inspect those with Flatpak. Um, so when an application is installed, you can see what permissions it's requesting, what the permissions in terms of what access it wants. Um, generally, then they're just used as is, they're not restricted in any way, but potentially you could restrict access to these if you wanted. Um, there's also a writable store, so the one bit of the, the sandbox is writable. There's a, this special location, dot, you know, dot var in the home directory, slash app, slash the, the ID of the app. That's so that an application that needs to keep some persistent state, like, say, the size of its window, or what was the currently last open uh, file, or something like that, that can all be stored there. Um, and that's very similar with uh, the, the XCG directory, it's like XCG config home, and, and user home, and all these sorts of things. Um, all of those environment variables are set to writable locations, so they will work as they would normally do. Um, so as long as your application respects those, and any application that uses GTK correctly, and I think most of the KDE libraries correctly, it will just work with those without any other alterations. So I mentioned briefly that Dbux actually, um, while it is present in the sandbox, is uh, uh, restricted with the use of a filtering proxy. Um, that's because if we gave uh, an application access to the whole session bus, well, then it could do anything it wanted anyway, because you can just call, say, a method on gnome shell on the session bus, and it will launch an application, and it, you, can, you can, again, that's like having access to pretty much everything if you have access to the session bus. You can do anything that the user can do. So we restrict what you can do on the session bus to only owning your own name uh, and talking to um, the flat pack um, interfaces. Um, you can also open that up. So at the moment, you have to open up things like dconf. You have to say, yes, the app can talk to the dconf daemon. Um, that's going to change, which I'll talk about a little bit in the future. Um, the portals actually are an exception. So I briefly mentioned portals earlier. Uh, there are ways that you can break out of the sandbox in a controlled way. Um, and those, the application can always talk to. And those are under any uh, org.3s.portal. Uh, interface, those are all unrestricted. So in more detail, um, a portal is what we put what we, what we put between um, the sandbox and the host system um, that allows the application running inside the sandbox to do something on the host system. It's a trusted interface, um, and we don't expect the application to do anything directly. Like we, you know, we don't necessarily give the access, application access to you know, a, a file on the disk and say, yes, this is where the file is located, because that would be leaked information. What we'll generally do in that case is pass it a file descriptor, so it can write to it, but it doesn't actually know where the file is, and it can't access any other information about the host system. Um, most of the portals show a dialog to request permission from the user. But this isn't the traditional yes-no dialogue, like, do you want this application to access this file on the system? Because that's quite a clunky and awkward way of doing it. Um, and those you would easily just dismiss and say, yes, yes, let the application do everything. So we make this an implicit choice by, generally, the file chooser is a classic example. If an application running inside the sandbox wants to access a file, then open a file chooser dialog. That is provided by TTK. The user selects a file, the user is given their explicit permission for this file to be open. Um, there's no need to ask a separate question, the user's already answered that for them. So, much better. Um, there's a permission store that's part of, uh, well, it used to be part of, well, it is part of Flatpak, um, uh, where these decisions about what files have been given access to uh, and what permissions have been granted, that's all stored so that you answer this question once or maybe a few times that's something more risky um, and we remember that. It's also used for various other things like storing document portal mappings and things like that. And you can use Flatpak commands to inquire about what uh, those permissions are. I'll talk about that later. Uh, there's also a special uh, Flatpak portal 
um, which is so that you can restart your application and spawn a process inside or outside the sandbox. Um, and uh, it's pretty pretty specialised, but maybe we'll be seeing more of that use in the future. So, in terms of what portals are provided, uh, they're actually generally at the moment provided by a package called XCG Desktop Portal. Uh, XCG is like the old name for um, the X Desktop group, which is where XCG app came from, which is what came, became Flatpak, the name stuck around for a little while. Um, you can also use these portals from within Snap, um, and uh, they work in the same way, because it's the same database interface, so that's great. That means all of your sandbox applications that are using Snap or Flatpak should work just the same. Um, as I said, it's a set of interfaces for interacting with the host system. Um, they rely on a back end to actually do the work. Um, so actually desktop portal is just the interfaces um, and it's, it's kind of the barrier between the host and the, uh, uh, and the sandbox. But in terms of actually showing the dialogue and doing the platform specific stuff, you need an actual um, back end service. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the nice thing about a lot of the portals is they, they have some built-in support in the toolkit. So GTK itself, uh, knows when the application that it is running under a sandbox uh, and it can actually show a file to user automatically uh, and handle a lot of the background communication with the portal itself so you don't even have to think about it for a lot of things which is great, it's very transparent um, So I mentioned a couple of the uh, portals already but there, there are quite a few um, we might see more as in the future and there are a few more that I haven't listed here as well but the common ones that most applications would probably use are the, uh, the file chooser, the documents portal, even if that's used implicitly as part of the file chooser, the notification and the URI portal. So the URI portal, you can, you can open the URI, whether that's a, a website address or something else that's on the system, um, but that will handle calling out to the host system and opening that URI for you. Um, there are other portals that are maybe a little bit less common. Printing is a little bit less common, email, Screenshotting and screencasting, those portals uh, on, on an XC desktop portal's GTK side, they actually call out to known shell to take a screenshot of the system because the, the application running inside the sandbox doesn't have access to the whole display, um, where the, the shell does, the compositor does. Um, there are also the inhibit portal, the network portal, the proxy portal. There are a few others, but those are the main ones. Uh, the flatback portal I already talked about very briefly. It's, it's quite kind of specialised. It really only has two features, and that's spawning a process inside the sandbox. That's actually kind of useful because you can actually spawn a process with more restrictive sandboxing inside the sandbox. And that's kind of handy if maybe you want to make a thumbnailer or something along those lines. Um, it also turns out to be quite handy if you just want to respawn your application when there's been an updated version of it, uh, because then you can spawn the new version automatically. Um, and hopefully there'll be a bit more sort of automation around that in the future. Um, all the portals use an interface called org.freedesktop.portal.request. Uh, this is because if we, if we didn't use that, we just you know, used just method call, ZBus method calls and replies, there's a 30 second timeout for that. So if the user took 30, more than 30 seconds to select the file on the file to user, which is pretty common, especially if they you know, went off and got coffee or something, then that request would time out, uh, and so that's not very good. Uh, so we have this sort of uh, request interface where you basically say, I want to do this action, and then when the request is complete, you get a signal back from that object, so then you know when to continue and when the user accepts that or cancelled it or whatever. Um, so it's a pretty common pattern. Um, I mean, most of the time, actually, you don't have to use these DBus interfaces directly. They're generally handled for you on the toolkit side, but if you do need to, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how you might do that. Um, so as I said, you, you, make a, you make a request to the portal on um, whatever the interface that you're using is, um, and you get back a handle. Uh, which gives you uh, an object path to this uh, org.freedesktop.portal request interface. Um, that has a signal on it um, that once your um, dialog has been shown and the user's given some interaction or cancel, you then get that response signal received uh, and you know that then that interaction is complete. Um, then the application processes that response, does something with it, say it got a file back, you know, maybe then it opens it, uh, and then generally that's done. Uh, sometimes this request can persist and there's a separate interface for that called the session interface. That's generally the case if you have something like 
your screen kind of thing, or you, know, you have some, some long running thing um, that you request the permission for at the start, and we'll keep running until you either stop that or until your application closes. So I briefly mentioned the document portal. This is um, uh, uh, it's actually a, a Fuse file system um, which maps files on uh, the host system to, to what was opened inside the sandbox. Um, it's um, generally implicitly used. Um, so things like if you use the file chooser portal, then this will, I think, implicitly use the document portal. So you often don't need to worry about it directly and probably shouldn't worry about it directly. Um, but you can actually check the permissions um, that the document portal currently has by using the Black Mac document list. Um, and there are a few other commands that you can use to inspect uh, what those documents are. Uh, you can also actually see the file directly if you want to, in slash run, slash user, and then your UOD, slash doc. You can actually just see the files there, which is quite cool. Um, yeah, generally, toolkits would be using this for you, um, for and handling the bus uh, interactions. You generally don't really use it yourself, but it's kind of instructive to just have a quick look about um, what files are there. Um, I talked briefly about um, the, uh, the front end to the XG Desktop Portal back end uh, service. So the XG Desktop Portal GTK is one of those. There's also XG Desktop Portal KE. The GTK one uses uh, both GTK and GNOME uh, interfaces. So as I said, for screenshots and, and screencasting is going to use GNOME Shell. Um, also, it uses the implicit, well, the sort of seamless support that's in GTK. Um, so if you open a file and file to use it, um, then that's just going to work automatically out of the box. Uh, and most um, operating systems will set this up for you, just like Fedora. If you have GTK installed, Flatpak installed, it'll make sure that the XTD desktop portal GTK is installed so that this just works for you. Um, again, you won't actually interact with this directly, it's just something that you need in order for the portals to work. Um, so, what do we want in the future? Uh, well, I mentioned earlier that um, DCOMP is still uh, a little bit awkward. You still have to allow that explicitly through the sandbox. Um, it would be nice, nice if that wasn't the case. DCOM is quite complicated because it's really a, a big database um, uh, and you can have individual permissions in various parts of that database. Um, and there are signals when properties change and things like that. So actually, it's, it's a pretty difficult thing to just pass through the sandbox. Um, but that's currently what you have to do. You kind of have to pass everything through. Um, so, in order to restrict this so that the application can only access its individual part of DCOM, um, we need to have some special support in DCOM for this. Um, we need some container support in, uh, in, in Dbus. So, the Dbus daemon is now growing support for noticing when the Dbus client is in the container, so we need that. Um, and then we need a little bit of support in Flatpak, although well, I think that's mostly there now. Um, so, I'm hoping we'll be working on this. But there's nothing to show yet, and there's still quite a lot of work to do. Um, but we're hoping that post Flatpak 1.0, um, there's going to be some good support for DCOM working on the Flatpak. Um, in terms of the screen sharing support, I mentioned that Gnome Show actually uh, handled this for uh, the, the screencasting portal at the moment. Um, we also want a little bit to be able to sort of, you know, have some more control over that, uh, and we want other client applications to directly support it. Uh, I believe that the, the work on getting this um, to work on the Firefox is actually almost complete now. So, so soon if you have a, a video conferencing solution on the Firefox, maybe it's using WebRTC, normally you would be able to share your desktop over that if you're using uh, that on your host system, but not if you're running it inside a flat pack right now. But the support for doing that is very nearly complete. Um, I think that I saw a demo of it, well, I heard about a demo of it quite recently. So it might take a while to get merged into Firefox and to land, but it's, it's very near, the code is nearly there now. Um, that uses Pipewire, um, which is uh, another cool technology for um, passing uh, video and audio around through the sandbox uh, out to the system, vice versa. Um, and uh, that's actually maturing really quickly, so it's definitely a project to look at, into. Um, Matthias has been doing some work on, uh, well, all sorts of work on flat packs, but specifically he's been blogging about um, like self-updating applications, um, and maybe we'll see some better support for that in the future. Currently, it's a little bit clunky. Um, you have to like do all of this spawning yourself and, and monitor, monitor when there's an update application and things. 
So maybe there'll be some talk about that in the future. That would be pretty cool. Um, but uh, who knows? In terms of resources, if you want to learn more about this, obviously you're welcome to talk to me throughout the conference or, or Matthias, and there are probably a couple other people who can um, talk to you about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and um, just talk to any one of us. Uh, if uh, that's uh, too scary, then by all means go and have a look at these URL and read them. Um, there are some good blog posts there. Uh, you can come and find us on the ISC and the Hashtag Pack channel on the free node. Um, there is a mailing list as well, I think. But basically, if you go on the, the Flatpak uh, organization on GitHub, you'll see all the code. There's lots of documentation that you can find there. Um, so, yeah, there's really a lot of background material. You probably find it known as well. You'll see a lot of blog posts about it, uh, especially from Alex and Matthias, um, who are generally doing a lot of the work on it. Um, so, we all need to look. And that just leads me to ask for questions. Thank you very much. 